Welcome fellow recovering traditionalists to episode 208, the number relationships that transform math understanding. So this is episode two of my series on building math fluency in elementary students. I'm sharing some of the foundational concepts that actually build students' mathematical understanding, not just their ability to follow procedures. The first episode, in case you missed it, but I will link it up in the show notes, but the first episode was all about the four early numeracy concepts that all students need around all types of numbers. Yes, even fractions and decimals, but most of them really centered around counting. Yet one of the biggest concerns I hear from teachers is that you can't get students to stop counting. So this episode is about helping your students stop counting. However, I want to make sure that you know that counting and even counting on fingers is an important foundation. Kids need the time and experience with counting and counting on their fingers. However, we don't want them to stay there. We don't want third graders counting on their fingers to solve seven plus eight. Let's be real. And we don't want sixth graders counting one by one by one to solve multiplication problems. When they first start learning that concept, they will count. And that's totally great. That's where we want them. But if they haven't progressed past that, they are most likely missing some key number sense foundations. And once you know what those foundations are, you can finally help them break free from counting. Welcome to Build Math Minds, the podcast, where fidelity to your students is greater than fidelity to your textbook. I'm your host, Christina Tonnevold, the recovering traditionalist and buildmathminds.com founder, where my mission is to change the way we teach elementary math to our kiddos. So are you ready to start building math minds and not just creating calculators? Let's get started. These relationships are the secret sauce that makes everything else in math make sense. They show students how numbers connect to each other. They're what allow students to think flexibly, to see patterns, and to actually develop math strategies in a way that makes sense instead of just following the steps mindlessly. We were taught to help students memorize facts. Probably you even memorized your own facts, right? We weren't taught to help them understand the relationships between numbers. We just taught that eight plus five is 13. We didn't really think about, even personally, most of us didn't think about how eight plus five is also eight plus two plus three. But if you were anything like me, when you did start this focus on different strategies, I just taught the steps for those strategies. And I had the kids basically memorize those steps. But doing that led to more and more things that my students had to memorize. And instead, when we start focusing on number relationships, everything changes for students. Now, these four number relationships come from the work of John Vandewall and friends uh, from the book that I call my math Bible. I'll put it right up here, but it's teaching student-centered mathematics. And they come from specifically the pre-K to two book. However, as I said before, just like with the early numeracy stuff, This progresses as students are working all the way through elementary school. So these four number relationships are spatial relationships, one and two more or less, the benchmarks of five and 10, which then just become all benchmark numbers, and part, part, whole. These might sound simple, but they are incredibly powerful. And just like with the foundations of counting, These relationships start in pre-K, but they develop all the way through fifth grade. So let's take a look at each one. The first relationship, as I said, was spatial relationships. This is really about seeing numbers in arrangements and patterns, and then using those to build relationships between quantities. This builds directly on subitizing, which we mentioned in the first video, but it just goes deeper. In kindergarten and first grade in the beginning, those spatial relationships really help students recognize the five dots, whether it's in a line or in a circle pattern or the dice pattern. And those those visuals then help them see 
how five is then connected or related to things like four, six, seven, really any number out there. And then as they progress, students should start to use those spatial relationships to understand place value. Like they should see 23 is, yeah, two groups of 10 and three ones, right? That's the typical thing. But can they also see how that transforms into 110 and 13 ones? They should be able to visualize 23 on a number line and understand that it's between 20 and 30 and be able to tell you where it is in relation to 25, one of those benchmark numbers that we're going to be talking about. And then as they progress in, these spatial relationships become crucial for helping students understand fractions and when they're doing area. So when students like look at a fraction model, can they see the relationship between the part and the whole? Or do they see how this fraction relates to another fraction? That's all part of spatial relationships. Students with strong spatial relationships don't need to draw out every single unit one by one by one to understand a problem. They can visualize and then use those mental images to help them solve problems efficiently. The second relationship is one and two more or less. This idea is tied directly to counting. Yet lots of kids don't see that. They've been counting and saying the sequences of numbers, but this idea helps them tie those counts to adding more and subtracting out some to make it less. And the first place you start with that is adding and subtracting one or two. Those should be instantaneous for kids that they can tell you what's one more, one less, right? And that's basically where it starts in the early grades. Students need to learn that seven is one more than six and one less than eight, right? And then this relationship starts to build into units. So when kids are dealing with place value, they need to think about one ten more or maybe two tens less, two hundreds more, one hundred less. And then in upper elementary, those relationships start to develop around fractions and decimals. Do they know what one tenth less is? Can they look at five eighths and know that it's one eighth more to get to six eighths? which is really three fourths, which is one of those benchmarks that we need them familiar with. But here's the problem we see all the time. When students don't have this relationship, it makes strategy development so much harder. When they see 23 plus 29, they will not think about it as 23 plus 30, okay? They have to have this one and two more or less developed before they will ever start to see and understand those strategies. This brings us into our third relationship, which is using those benchmark numbers. And it starts out with the benchmarks of five and 10, right? But it transforms into benchmarks of all kinds of numbers. There are all kinds of friendly numbers. You can call them friendly numbers, benchmark numbers, whatever you want, but it's those numbers that kids tend to use as reference points. In early elementary, students do need to learn and see how numbers relate to five and 10. They need to see seven as five and two more or eight as two away from 10. This makes adding and subtracting so much easier. And instead of counting by ones, they can actually use these benchmarks because any number is always three or less away from a benchmark number. Now this relationship gets more sophisticated as students get older. They use five and 10 as benchmarks when they're multiplying because knowing what 10 groups of eight is can help you figure out what nine groups of eight is. They use multiples of 10 as benchmarks when they're adding and subtracting, like when they're solving 38 plus 25, they can use 40 plus 25 and then take two away. Do you see how the one and two more or less just came in with that strategy also? So in upper elementary, students should also be using benchmark fractions. They should know that three eighths is less than a half and that seven eighths is close to one, that one and thir three fourths is close to two. These are just some examples, but these benchmarks make adding and subtracting fractions so much easier. Without understanding how numbers relate to benchmarks, students will never be able to understand those strategies that you're trying to teach them. Now, our last number relationship is part, part, whole. This is the understanding that numbers can be broken apart and recombined in different ways. 
This is such an essential relationship for developing flexibility with numbers. And in the early grades, it's just things like that eight can be broken up into five and three and four and four and six and two and seven and one. They learn that you can decompose numbers in lots of different ways. But one of the things we need to help them understand is that the one that you decompose it into is dependent upon the problem that they're doing at the moment. Like if I have seven plus eight, I might decompose it differently than if I'm doing eight plus five, right? So in the upper grades, students start to use this part, part, whole thinking with larger numbers and with multiplication. They should see that 25 times four can be broken into 20 times four and five times four. They should be breaking apart numbers strategically in a way that helps make calculations easier. That's the point of part, part, whole. Now, part, part, whole thinking is also needed for fractions. Students need to understand that three-fourths is really three one-fourth pieces, and that that can be combined into things like two-fourths and one-fourths, which is really a half and a fourth, which helps them understand how it relates to benchmark numbers. You see how all this really works together? This part, part, whole thinking helps students see an easier problem within harder problems. Too often, we see students who know five plus five, but they don't understand that when they have six plus five, it contains five plus five within it. Or when they multiply 25 times four and they get 100, but when we ask them to then to multiply 25 times eight, they have no idea and they don't see the connection between those. They can't see that 25 times eight is just double what 25 times four was. They're missing that part, part, whole relationship. Now here's what happens when students have these four relationships. They become flexible thinkers. They don't just have one way to solve a problem. They have multiple strategies that they can choose from depending upon the numbers that are involved. They can look at eight plus five and think, oh, I'm going to take two from the five and make it 10 plus three. They can look at four and three eighths plus three and three fourths and think three and three fourths. Hmm, that's just like a fourth away from four, which is a nice benchmark number. So I'm just gonna take two eights, which is really a fourth, from the four and three eights to make the four, and now I have four and an eighth plus four. They can estimate, they can check their work, and they actually know whether or not their answers make sense. Without these relationships, students are really stuck just following procedures without understanding. They might be able to get correct answers, but they can't explain anything beyond just the steps that they took to solve it. They can't adapt when the numbers change and they often struggle with word problems because they don't understand relationships between quantities. So here's your task for this week. As you're teaching, start asking questions that reveal these relationships. Don't just ask, what's the answer? Ask, how did you see it? How does blank relate to blank? You fill in the numbers there. Could you solve it a different way? When a student just says an answer, ask them, how did you think about it? And if they say, I don't know, I just know it, you could say something like, if someone in our class didn't understand how to get to the answer, how would you help them figure it out? That gets them to kind of tell another way to think about it. Even if they just know it, I wanna dig a little deeper to find out do they have some thinking around that or do they just have memorized it or have these steps that they've used that are just following procedures? These questions help you see what relationships your students have and which ones they still need to develop. And the more you ask these questions, the more your students will start thinking in terms of relationships instead of just procedures. If you want help with specific questions or tasks to give your students that help you dig into what number relationships they have and which ones they're still working on, I do have a free number sense assessment. The assessment is part of my number sense ebook and I put one together for pre-K to two and three five. The PDF gives you an overview of each of these four number relationships. So if this quick little podcast or if you're watching the video wasn't enough, it'll give you information about each one and it gives you tasks or questions you can ask your students to see how they're progressing in their development of each of these relationships. So head to the show notes, which is buildmathminds.com slash 208, 
and there will be a link to request access to the pre k to two and the three five. Now this access you get is not just for the number sense ebook. It actually gives you access to a bunch of free resources that I have for each of those grade bands. So once you get the email that has the link that will take you to those free resources, just look on that page for one that's titled something like overview of number relationships and assessment. Okay, that's the document you want to get. And when you get to that page, it'll have the PDF of it, along with some other videos if you want to learn more about the number relationships. So once you've done some of the tasks with your students and you know which relationships your students are needing a little bit more help developing, I've got a great activity that you can do to help build those relationships. But that's coming in the next episode. So thank you for joining me for episode two. We've now covered all eight number sense concepts, the four early numeracy foundations, and then the four number relationships. And as I said, in the next episode, I'm gonna show you one of my favorite practical tools for building all of these concepts. In a past episode, I talked about making math experiences for students 1% better by changing just five minutes of your math time. In our next episode, I'm gonna be sharing one of my favorite five minute activities and how it helps you build these foundational number sense concepts. So don't forget to go to buildmathminds.com 208 to get the resources and the number sense assessment. And I'll also link up the 1% better activities video in case you missed that episode. So until next week, my fellow recovering traditionalists, keep letting your students explore math, keep questioning, and most importantly, keep building math minds.